and welcome to episode number 69 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Welcome back and it's good to see you. We have really good questions today. Our first question is from Nicole. I need to hold a plank for three minutes for a work-related fitness test. Three minutes is a fairly good sized uh, plank. Um, I test two minutes. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the value after two, but that's, hey, it's your test. I got to help you. I can currently hold one for 90 seconds. You're halfway there. How would you approach getting closer to the three minute mark? Um, well, thanks for letting me know where you are. So in a sense, Nicole, you're not halfway there. You're, you're, you're farther than that. Uh, under, the, uh, under the pressure of the test, you, you will go longer. Uh, how much uh, kind of depends. A couple things. Um, one thing I would suggest to you, I don't know if you're doing this kind of plank or this kind of plank, but uh, if it's this kind, we have, we're a little bit tighter with the, the number of options we have. But one of the things I'd like you to think about is why you're doing the plank is to make it harder. So one of the ways you can make it harder is to lift one foot. So m do it kind of like a track athlete would attack this. So um, you're going to do a 30 second plank in training. So plank, hold for 10 seconds, pick up your right foot for 10 seconds, pick up your left foot for 10 seconds, whew, rest. Try that two or three times, just practicing making it harder. Um, you can also certainly put on a backpack and do other things like that. I just don't think that's going to be necessary. Uh, if you can, I would like to see you play around at about the 45 second mark for a while. Uh, in your in your resistance practice, uh, half of your current max. So you're doing an easy strength approach to this. So we could even just do that simple drill. 15 seconds, normal. 15 seconds, right foot lifted. And all you can do is elevate the foot. You know, it only has to be a few inches, centimeters. Uh, and then left foot for 15 seconds. Completely relax. Walk around, shake it off. Repeat that. You know, you might want to repeat that 45 seconds. If you repeat that four times, there's your test. Um, that's not bad. That's not a bad training session. Uh, maybe one day a week, uh, work up to maybe up to nine minutes of planking. Uh, do that in like 30 and 45 second bursts. Try not to go to failure on those. Try to get just so comfortable in the plank that you, you you're just you're just used to being there. Um, uh, when I teach this at seminars, of course, I try to I try to make the plank harder. So when I when I push you and pull you and pick up your feet and stuff, I'm trying to make you plank harder for less time. Uh, you have the exact opposite pro uh, problem. <laughs> we just have to kind of be there for three minutes. Uh, I would coax your way to the three minutes, not force your way to the three minutes. And I think you'll be a lot happier by doing that. Uh, maybe two weeks before the next test, test test out again. Um, you know, don't be don't be cruel to yourself if you make it. Um, but the idea is just get comfortable in that position and slowly extend the time. One day a week, maybe up to nine minutes of total planking. I would say almost daily you want to plank. Uh, right now, I can't imagine a day going by where you don't do at least the forty five seconds maybe even a minute or two of practice, gentle practice. Don't push it too hard and you'll get there uh, pretty easily usually. These plank tests uh, are often just uh, uh, <laughs> human tricks and once you figure out how to hold it, you'll, you'll have it forever. I hope that helps. We have a question from Paul. I have a question about work capacity training. Good, thank you. I am currently reading Tim Anderson's wonderful book, The Becoming Bulletproof Project. Yeah, it's a very good book. Uh, Tim does good work. In it, Tim sets out a compelling case for doing work capacity training to build strength for what life throws at you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I would appreciate your thoughts on this type of training versus a more traditional reps and sets approach. Uh, Paul, first off, don't get into an either or thought here. Uh, don't, don't go down that idea that Tim thinks crawling and carrying are, are, are the answer to all questions and Dan, John, and all the others are saying five sets of five. That's, uh, Tim and I uh, very much uh, uh, knit together. Uh, first off, let me explain my concept of work capacity, okay? Uh, basically, it's this, it's kind of, this is the way I teach it. You come home from shopping for Thanksgiving, and in your car, the back of your car, you have 18 bags, 
weighing between 5 and 10 kilos, 10 and 20 pounds. And to get into your kitchen, you have to go up a flight of just 10 stairs. So the Dan John approach, you strap all 18 bags on there and you, you muscle it up and you go up that, those 10 stairs and you put them down and go, whew, done. Somebody else listening goes, that's stupid. I would pick up one at a time, but now that's 180 stairs. Hmm. So maybe someone else is thinking, no, I would do four. If that's too much, I go to two. And if that's not enough, I go to three. That's fine. To me, what work capacity is being able to do that entire matrix of one bag or 18 bags at once in uh, all the little ways in between. So for me, when I think of work capacity, I don't want to say it's a sliding scale. What I want to say is it's the ability to have a lot of capacities in a lot of different um, things that are thrown at you, challenges, if you will. Uh, Tim and I both agree uh, on the idea that crawling and carrying are the best ways to build work capacity. The push, the pull, and squat are the best ways I know to build hypertrophy. The hinge is the best way I know to get people to hit other people harder and to throw stuff far. Uh, and the loaded carry family and the, and the crawling and the monkey bars and all that stuff, that's the best way to build work capacity. Uh, so what you have here now then is you have a lot of tools and you need all the tools somehow if you're break, uh, building a, an American football player or a rugby player or a collision occupation person. Uh, if you're building a discus thrower, you need hinge and you need some work capacity. If you're building uh, a person who just wants to look good and feel good, push, pull, squat three days a week, some hinges, and then some work capacity. So when they get a phone call, Danny, will you help me move a couch? They can get in the car and go help me move that couch. So, Paul, there is no, there is no divide here. We agree completely with each other. And one thing I do like about your question, it does give me a chance to come back to something I first wrote about in 40 years with a whistle, but snapacity. Snapacity, snap capacity. And when I coach elite athletes, what I'm trying to do is build up their snap, which is basically the hinge, but of course, with all the other movements uh, supporting that. And then the ability to do that more and more and more. So maybe when I first work with the discus thrower, a, a, a relatively competent one, uh, that thrower might have three good throws in a workout. Well, part of my job is to build up the number of good throws in a workout. And that would be what I call snapacity. Uh, when, when I was in my best shape Olympic lifting, I could probably snatch and clean and jerk a fairly high number of heavy attempts. One of the things I've noticed in my career as I've moved away from, you know, snatching and clean and jerking three to five times a week is I don't have the capacity to snatch and clean and jerk like I used to. You know, uh, I've got, the only time I go heavy is at weightlifting meets now. And that's every couple of years. I have one coming right up. Uh, that's the only time I go heavy. I don't have the snapacity that I used to have. Uh, and I'm going to be sore, sore, sore the next day. Uh, I hope that helps. Good question, Paul. Thank you. This next question sneaks up into medical advice, but uh, I think I can still answer it. Guy asks us, I have an ingual, inguinal hernia, left side, I think it's that one, down, uh, due to a workplace-related injury and currently awaiting evaluation by a surgeon. Once cleared by a physician, how should I phase back into uh, training post-surgery? I have single kettlebells ranging from 12 to 32, and my body weight is a resource. Uh, I, I, uh, so I had that belly hernia, uh, I can't remember the name of it, umbilical, umbilical hernia. And one of the things I noticed, especially with the, the modern way we do it, is how quickly I healed. I think, I think my doctor, she told me to wait two weeks. Um, the, the thing I would, the only thing I would argue against, my, I gotta be, as much as I love kettlebells and body weight, those might be an issue at first, guy. Now. With COVID, you might not have an answer, but this is a nice time to go to machines for a few weeks because one of the things you don't want to do with a hernia and the mesh and all the other stuff is do what I call that anaconda, anaconda strength, that squeezing strength. 
like when you're carrying a, a hundred pound bag or a person like this or anaconda strength is when you have all that internal pressure you're filling yourself up like a you're filling up an inner tube for a, a bicycle tire uh, after hernia i think you need to put off training anaconda strength one of the reasons i love kettlebells is that they naturally teach anaconda strength in your case it's going to be uh, something you, you just want to put off a while guy i want you to talk to your surgeon i want you to express in the post and sort of explain what you're trying to do i wouldn't be surprised if they said machines are okay uh, general basic calisthenics uh, anything that uh, stops you from doing that i think would be okay for a while but with these modern surgeries uh guy i don't think you're gonna be down very long i'm now starting to slide into an area i'm not qualified to talk about but in my case uh, i went to this gym over here after my uh, umbilical hernia and i did leg extension leg curl um, uh, the push variation a push variation a pull and a pull i think that's all i did and i was in machines and I did that for probably two or three weeks. And actually, I felt pretty good and had a nice recovery. I hope that helps, Guy. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, follow what your surgeon says. Thank you. We have a question from Dee Dee. Is there something special about snatch that clean does not have besides overhead position? Or does this position, or is this position a game changer? You, it, well, Dee Dee, the, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting way to say that. Is this, you know, better than that? For me, the reason I like the snatch person, and I'm talking about the barbell snatch, not the kettlebell, is that for a, a discus thrower and for most things in life, uh, you need, uh, the tension level you need to snatch is the exact same tension level I need to throw the discus. So that's why I fell in love with it. Um, I, of course, I don't like either or questions, but the reason I like the snatch and the reason when I was 14 I thought, that the perfect work workout for Grandpa Danny, <laughs> I was a pretty smart kid, would be the squat snatch and the clean and press. And the reason I thought that is that the squat snatch demands such a high level of flexibility and mobility uh, that the clean, the clean demands a lot of wrist, elbow, shoulder flexibility, but the uh, the Olympic snatch demands so much shoulder and hip flexibility. And I thought that would be a great idea. Uh, doing the out overhead position, it is magical, I think. Uh, that's why I'm such a big believer in the overhead squat. Um, that, that it just, I call it a moving plank, and that your entire body has to be engaged. Um, yeah, let's get away from either ors, but uh, both of them have value, and I think both of them uh, should be in the program. Uh, if you only feel like learning the clean or just teaching the clean to your athletes, I completely understand that. Uh, I found later in my career that by teaching the snatch, it was so much easier to teach the clean. If you can snatch, it's easy to clean. Very often, people who can clean don't want to learn the snatch because it's harder. Uh, your mileage may vary. Thank you, Dee. Jamie asks a question. Is there anything you can share from your experience in training, work, life, nutrition, that you'd advise someone with burnout or a concussion history, look in or to or try. Okay, so there's burnout and there's concussion. I'm gonna answer the concussion side. Uh, I've had a bad concussion 2.5 years ago, two and a half years ago, and since then I've struggled with uh, falling into the repeated loop of overworking, burning out, crashing, recovering, and then starting again. Okay, Jamie, uh, we really are pushing into um, medical advice here, but I've had a serious concussion. I have a six month period in my life where I, I don't remember anything. Uh, I do have some handwriting samples from the period and it looks like a kindergartner's. Um, I get that. Well, I'll just tell you one thing that helps me a lot. Uh, I do get that weird wave of depression. One thing that helped me a lot, and that's gonna sound so simple, but God, it helped me a lot. Um, I now, when I feel a depression coming on, a low, a dark, what I call the dark night of the soul, I simply look at it and say, oh, huh, this can sound weird. Oh, that was caused, this is caused by a concussion. Remember that, this isn't you. This is a thing that comes by every so often. And I gotta tell you, it sounds so simple. 
I, and I, it really has helped me. So when it comes to concussion protocols and with my work with the military, I've been able to work with the best concussion protocol guy in the world. So I'm just going to tell you what he told me. Okay, it's going to start with, <laughs> it's going to start with sleep. Um, but I do want to add one small thing that he got me doing, which really helped. It's called cryotherapy, and that's when you go in the in the chamber and they make it really cold with nitrogen. I like the ones where the head is also in the vault. Now you have to wear earmuffs and gloves because otherwise, uh, certain parts of your body might freeze off. Uh, underwear's a good idea. Um, socks, but shockingly, cryotherapy really helped me. Uh, even something as simple as I do what's called the James Bond shower, and that's when you uh, you take you know you do your normal shower you know you shave and do your hair and whatever you know. and then you put on ice water and I just stick my head in there and listen uh, uh, Jamie if it's voodoo it's voodoo but you know it, it's working I haven't had the dark moments in a while which always scares me to say out loud because then it's like oh here comes one uh, so a couple things first acknowledge that you had a concussion you know kind of remind yourself okay I got this thing and it probably did some damage up there but it's just a thing oh here it is okay uh, if you can the cryotherapy the ice showers I'm sure an ice bath would help I'm sure exposure to cold would help uh, in the winter I have gone to wearing short sleeves uh, because well I guess it's good for your fat burning or brown fat or something but it also seems to help me with my concussions and then now let's get to the big one which is sleep um, you need to make sure your room is cooler than you think um, I remember when we were first told about this they said 72 the sleep researcher guy told me 62 which is a huge you know hugely cooler than I thought there are pillows that you can now buy that have cooling in them uh, I have a little thing we put on our bed which is just a cover but it keeps it keeps the it keeps the whole body a little bit cooler um, you want the room to be as dark as you possibly can be and as quiet as you possibly can be uh, I would even go so far um, I thought I had one up here but I have this little I have these little Bluetooth headphones that also is a mask for your eyes it's a mask for your eyes Bluetooth and you maybe even want to I use brain.fm uh, there's a guided sleep in there with uh, all these different noises so you get you don't hear anything you don't see anything uh, keep yourself cool um, but sleep is sleep is the big fix um, you might even want to look in now I'm completely off off out of my lane right now but you might even want to look into seeing a therapist uh, seeing a specialist on this and talking in more depth uh, one of the things about concussions it can it can bring up some of the muddied waters of your life and something as simple as sitting down with somebody it could even be a good friend uh, and talking about some stuff might really make you go ah, I have several f friends that I trust and I can talk to them about certain life issues and it is it is a great relief uh, the other thing Jamie it's only been two and a half years I know that sounds like a long time but um, uh, concussions seem to slowly wave down it's kind of like uh, my brothers had malaria when I was growing up and uh, <laughs> I feel the same way about concussions if you can survive the first part you're gonna survive the whole thing uh, Jamie I know it was all over the place but I hope that helped okay and keep in touch okay Evan writes I have a question about the power clean when I receive the bar during the clean <clears throat> it lands hard on my left collarbone leaving a constant bruise and raised bump this bump is tender to the touch for a couple days then shrinks a bit in size and feels less tender until my next cleaning session my right collarbone is fine it's just the left side which is which has this I only notice this collarbone issue as my cleans get to body weight and above right is this a normal part of cleaning or am I just being a wimp and is there something I can do to fix it uh, I used to talk to my students very candidly about being in junior college and basically having this ridge of what you have as a callus and then God would send down 
zits. To, so I would have zits with calluses on that collarbone ridge. Yeah, it's normal. I find it interesting it's only on one side, and I'd love to see a picture of your position. I'm wondering if, you know, maybe one elbow is more flexible than the other or something like that. I'm <laughs> watching myself do that on the screen. Uh, this scared me a little bit. But yeah, it's very normal. Uh, it is part of the fun. Uh, it's the same, in my, if, if I'm understanding correctly, it's just like the calluses you get in your hands and inside your thumb. It's just part of the fun of the Olympic lifts. Uh, you're going to, uh, it, it's going to probably stay, especially, uh, it would be also interesting to see the knurling on your bar. Uh, it could be, um, it could be that your bars are just have a, a hard knurling. Uh, at the Pacifica Barbell Club, our barbells were so old uh, and so chalk laden that uh, you'd have a, you'd have to go in and scrub the grips out sometime with a wire brush so you can get any you could just get the knurling that was there you know five years ago before all the sweat and goo got on it and we didn't think about san sanitation back then I can tell you that um, yeah it's it's normal uh, if it's terrible move to the snatch okay but it is normal. All right, and I hope that helps. We got a question from Ben. First, thanks for the pressing tip. Quick up, three pumps, uh, you know, those little pumps, slow down. Over the past six weeks, I've increased pressing strength, and I'm getting those weird muscles along the upper ribs you described, uh, the intercostals, yeah. And this is despite really low frequency using the three days a week uh, 531 program. Okay. Second, the last question on podcast 66 made me think about how some exercises seem to be a test of strength, uh, a party trick kind of move, while others build strength and <clears throat> loaded windmills, heavy Turkish get-ups, etc. seem to fit in the former category, uh, party tricks. For me, pull-ups are somewhere in the middle, I like where your head's at, whereas squats and presses of any variety are definitely in the latter category. Uh, I don't know if that's a question or a comment, but I think you're right. Uh, I think, like, for example, the bent press. Um, there's a good reason the bent press went out of favor. It's, it's, it is a bit of a party trick, and we have better ways to establish that somebody is strong. Uh, <laughs> the deadlift. And if you pull a 1,000 pounds, you're pretty strong. And, uh, and lastly, I know sometimes you have your students do a 5x5 five five rep scheme, but... As far as I can understand from the podcast, generally recommend three by eight or easy strength for most of us. Exactly. Do you think five by five with weight consistent across sets is more taxing on the system than three by eight? Or is it just about the same thing? You know, finally a question. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, let's just do the math. Let's just say you're doing push, pull, hinge, squat. Okay, just those four. Um, if you do three by eight, that's 12 sets. If you do five by five, that's 20. Um, for a typical person, that extra 20 sets time-wise is maybe what? Probably 30 plus extra minutes in the workout. Um, how much more impact is that 30 extra minutes going to be on your basic hypertrophy mobility and all the other itties? Uh, I don't know. So sometimes with uh, what I would consider everybody else, most of us sliding to three sets of eight, three sets of five, and then maybe to five sets of three, and then five sets of five, there's a nice little program for you. Uh, that extra half an hour of work uh, should be fitted as appropriate into a normal person's life. Uh, we're coming up uh, as I'm doing this to Thanksgiving and Christmas, and this is a time to do three sets of eight or three sets of five because you've got stuff to do around the house. And uh, it's this is the time of year to, well, as best you can, be with family and friends. Um, I don't know, uh, May and April when you've got more time, five sets of five. So really for, uh, for, for me, Ben, uh, the answer to that question is most, when I'm talking about everybody else, is simply a time issue. Uh, when I recommend easy strength, uh, for most people, one of the things they always come back is, I have so much more energy. Well, it's because the workout took 15 minutes, not an hour. Uh, that extra 45 minutes sometimes, uh, it might just be the headspace you need 
to, to get through life and <laughs> everything else. So, I, yeah, thanks. You know what, Ben? That's in my workshops. I'm going to remember that uh, because that the, 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 the it's so obvious to me, but it wasn't. So uh, thanks for the clarity. Okay, thank you, Ben. We have a question from Tino. Recently, I have been starting my journey as a personal trainer, and it's a journey. One of my clients is a college-level baseball player and suffers from a pre-existing shoulder injury, partial dislocations depending on positioning. But like many other athletes, he has been playing through his injury despite the limitations it gave him. Due to the pandemic, he has been out of practice for some time and wants to get back into training. I was wondering if you had any tips or suggestions in terms of working around this injury or any other ideas of proper ways to go about training. I just did a workshop with John Buck on his podcast, and it's in my Wandering Weights, um, and it's about baseball injuries. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, Tino, I don't know if he's still going to keep playing uh, or what, but uh, we do know that simple hanging is money for uh, shoulder issues. So if I can get him to hang around for a while, that might help immensely. Uh, certainly, uh, any kind of leg work is great. Uh, that includes not just goblet squats and things like that, but also uh, any kind of running, ideally, if he's competing still, turning more to sprinting. Um, any, any leg work we can get in, any lower body work. Throwing specifically, I'd like, I wouldn't mind him using the four pound Dynamax ball. And I only recommend Dynamax medicine balls for this because they're big. But any kind of overhead throwing or chest pressing or behind the back throwing, um, have him go slow and take his time working it up to that. But that can be money. And then two baseball specific things. If he's right handed, have him throw a lot with his left hand. The brain works in mysterious ways. But when you're throwing left-handed, it's going to help the right side. Uh, there's a very famous pitcher that I got to hang around with a bit. Uh, and he throws better with his offhand, his left hand, than 99.999% of the pitchers I've ever worked with. Um, great athletes can do both sides. And then the final thing, okay, so lots of goofy hand throwing until this comes around, if it ever comes around. And the last one, if, if you can find... Oh, I don't know. If, if he has to, just use a softball. But if he can start throwing into a wall backwards, into a wall backwards, uh, use the, that motion. So what we're trying to do is left hand and backwards throwing might help him with the balance of some of the issues, uh, imbalances that he's put together during his life. I hope that helps. Uh, it's always hard to give this kind of advice without being able to see it. Thank you, Tina. We have a question from Dave. My son is now in a firefighting program through his high school in conjunction with the lower, the local fire station. With his condensed, because of COVID, six-week wrestling season coming up, he will have to balance these two commitments. Firefighting is definitely his priority. However, he is lucky that his wrestling coach is willing to make this work. My son spends every sixth night at the fire station which includes some easy for him physical training, as well as potential calls throughout the night. He also has an all day fire school on Fridays, which is often very exhausting. I just gotta tell you, that's kinda cool, you know, I think that's great. So he will miss his evening wrestling practice approximately one, uh, once per week due to his first station night, and is pretty often worn out the next day. He will also go into his Friday night wrestling practice quite tired from his Friday's fire school. Do you have any advice for keeping his energy and recovering up uh, uh, through this six-week blitz? Well, yeah, Dave, it's only six weeks. <laughs> I mean, it's only six weeks. I have a daughter who's pregnant. That's 40 weeks. Uh, uh, the Royal Marines is, you know, much longer. Uh, yeah. So six weeks isn't so bad. And it's going to be the normal stuff. Uh, he's got to get good quality of sleep. Of course, uh, did you give me his age? Uh, no, but he's in high school. And one of the issues with most high school boys is they really struggle sleeping at night. So one of the things I want you to think about is the sleep hygiene. Um, make sure his computer, uh, make sure he doesn't have a computer in his bedroom. Uh, take that cell phone and lock it up overnight. Uh, no TV. Uh, I would strongly recommend no TV on school nights. Uh, might not be a bad idea outside of homework. 
no computer on school nights. Um, you know, have them read great books. <laughs> There's a shock for a high school kid. Um, it is true, and I mentioned this before, the James Bond shower, a hot shower, you know, for showering, uh, for shaving and hair and all that. And then followed by an ice cold rinse seems to really help. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be sleep. Um, there's a debate in my world about napping versus not napping. Uh, I don't, I don't know about that, but I would recommend that you. And it's not a bad idea from the start. Uh, I use the app on my phone called One Moment Meditation. It's a one-minute meditation. I think, I think it's one of the simplest things you can do. I count my breaths during the one minute. I find if I'm at five, six, or seven, uh, that's when I tend to be at my best. <laughs> If I'm at 10 breaths, I might not want to work out that day, 12 breaths. And if, oddly, if I'm at three or two, it's not a good day for me. And I actually have talked to some smart people about that, and that's that whole uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. Um, yeah, sleep, try the meditation, sleep hygiene, and remember it's just six weeks. Uh, we can do anything for two to six weeks, okay? And good luck with you. What a great program. We have a question from Jay. My question is about the triple extension uh, kettlebell swing, which is mentioned briefly in Easy Strength, but not to my knowledge in any of your other articles or audios. Jay, I'll just tell you this. If I talked about something 10, 20, 30 years ago and I don't mention it, it's usually not a very good idea. This isn't a very good idea. We'll continue. Is this something I might try in the future with the approval of my therapist well, kind of depends on what kind of therapist you're going to. Uh, uh, we'll stop there. Uh, to include a little more dynamic ankle work during my training, or is it something that seemed like a good idea at the time, writing, but you do not recommend it anymore? Jay, I got to tell you, I can't thank you enough for that question. Yeah, uh, people ask me stuff. Dan, you used to tell people to sprint as fast as they can and smash their face into a wall. You don't teach that anymore. Yeah, because it was a stupid idea. Or sometimes things come up and it's like, yeah, we're doing this. And I'll write about it and then I forget to, or the or I'll, the editor won't put a little uh, addendum at the bottom. It didn't work. Stop doing this immediately. Uh, yes, Jay, I have made a lot of dumb decisions in my life. I'm not sure this is the stupidest one, but trust me, uh, it's not the best one either. Great question. Jay, you're welcome anytime to ask questions. Thank you. We have a question from CJ. While doing pull-ups, I still feel like I'm pulling more with my bicep at times. Um, that by itself is an interesting question. Um, you know, we do teach at the certs I go to, we do teach uh, the, the pull-up. And one of the things that uh, hurts a lot of people who come from the bodybuilding background is they've turned that into a Frankenstein's monster exercise which makes it a bicep exercise and instead of a full literally full body movement uh, if you cross your ankles and you squeeze your knees together and try to pull your feet apart you know get yourself into that nice tight ab and you activate you know even you know you, you squeeze your butt cheeks and you squeeze your quads and you literally try to leap at the top of that uh, pull-up, you want to turn that into a leaping pull-up. You know, not with your with your feet, but your your whole body. Very quickly, you realize that uh, it's not a, it's not a bicep exercise. We'll continue. I use your method of holding uh, the top of the pull-up for time and hanging at the bottom of the pull-up for time. I am able to keep my shoulders anti-shrug during the pull-ups. What cues would you suggest to ensure I am correctly using my lats during the pull-up? my lats well once again uh, let's do that you know cross your feet cross your feet and try to pull them out squeeze your knees and try to pull them in you might have to practice on the ground well right there's a good drill uh, you might need to get a partner to help you with this drill but you lay on your back and you push your lower back into the ground as hard as you can that's the hollow rock position and by the way for the listeners who aren't interested in pull-ups that position by itself is pretty good then you're going to bring your feet up, cross them and pull them apart while still 
pushing your lower back into the ground as hard as you can. Then you want to squeeze your knees and flex your quads as hard as you can. And doing all this while I'm speaking, which is kind of funny when you think about it. And then take either a broomstick or a PVC pipe and put it here. Now, one of the things you can do if you have a partner, or you could probably even figure out a way to hook it up to something that'll hold it. But you, you get here. And what I want you to do is a a leg raise to this to where the to where the stick is, the broomstick is, where you're pushing your lower back in the entire time and you're gonna try to lift yourself up uh, to until you well, I was gonna say until your feet touch the uh, the, the broomstick, but uh, you're gonna have to be really careful about that. And what you'll begin to notice is that how the lats uh, form that X uh, down through your butt butt cheeks into your legs uh, because you're going to be using your lats as uh, kind of like uh, stabilizing uh, they're, they're the stick going to be the big stabilizers so that drill could help and then of course uh, uh, just just focusing on it as much as you can I always find it hard when people ask me to engage something how to help them through it especially in a podcast because in person I could just touch it or we could you could just we could get that aha moment let's finish this up recently you mentioned working with an individual from Russia who mentioned knew the true Soviet methods would you be able to give more insights into what this individual shared in general or anything else that really stood out well in almost every conversation I've ever had with a former Soviet, except for one, I'm not going to mention who it is, almost universally, poverty has come up first. The fact that they there was not a lot of vegetables available. Uh, parsley at a meal is a vegetable, and you eat the parsley. You never leave it on the plate. By the way, I've taken to doing that um, at restaurants that still serve parsley. Um, the painful poverty, the lack of things. So um, there might be, um, you know, Marty Gallagher uses one bar and adds load and everybody uses the one bar. That was the most common way of these guys training. So after you lifted, not only do you get a chance to see 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 other people snatch, but you also got a chance for the others to say with you, you know, you know, finish the lift, finish the lift, you know, or, you know, something about, Maybe something as simple as being braver with the bar, or pausing, or the chest position. Um, according to my one friend, many of the best lifters uh, at the Nationals would show up and, you know, borrow equipment. They were very poor, and in some cases, illiterate. So all those fancy things they were reading uh, weren't really uh, uh, helpful. The other thing that really amazed me is that so many of, especially the weightlifters, only lifted weights three days a week, but they were very full sessions and very much the way American lifters used to do. Uh, if the competition was, if the competition is snatch or clean and jerk, you snatched, you clean and jerked. And Wednesday you snatched and you clean and jerked. Uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, auxiliary exercises. Uh, when, when my friend Vasily then moved up and it was, it was at a better gym, one of the things that I thought was remarkable, and uh, if you read the work of, of Vasily Alexiev, the great uh, Soviet weightlifter, who later became a coach, uh, it was that more complex training. So Vasily had this one workout where he would do, with one bar, squat snatch, and he would go, you know, uh, uh, five sets of two. But after every rep, he would turn around to a lighter bar and maybe do... Uh, power snatch off the uh, off the boxes and I, I think what came across to me most was well a the, the sheer numbers of athletes um, that they had at disposal I mean you know I remember one time uh, some I can't remember if it was a 10 million Soviet weightlifters that, that's a lot of, of a pool but a lot of people liked weightlifting um, uh, it's like, why were the Soviets so good at chess? Well, everybody liked chess. So there's that great show called the uh, Queen's Gambit, where you know they go to a park and all these older men are playing chess, and uh, 
if you get a lot of people playing chess and it's popular, the level of chess is going to be pretty good. If you've got a lot of people Olympic lifting and it's possible, uh, popular, a lot of people are going to get stronger. But, okay, so that's number one. Let's put that to the side. But the other thing that just really came out in clarity, there'll be three things. Number two was the commitment to hard work, uh, to just working hard and the ability to see other people working hard with more weight who might be lighter than you, which made you want to lift more weight. And then there was a guy who was the same weight as you lifting more weight and you chased him. And then there was the other person lifting more weight and then you chased them. And then pretty soon you chased that nationally. Yeah, you get it now. Um, and the third thing that really comes across was, and this really comes true with when you talk to the Soviet throwers, is almost yearly they would try something different, something unique, uh, and always tinkering with what gets you to the higher level. Uh, in my lunch and dinner and bar conversations um, over and over again, it's this idea that there was no template and that people were trying to beat other people. And if all I did was do the same thing you were doing, I could, at best, unless I had the better DNA, I could tie you. But if we had the same basic abilities, I had to figure out a way to beat you. And that was, the, to me, the genius of what I, I got at bars and lunches. Great question, thank you. Well, there you go. Episode 69 is finished. Remember, if you have questions, email them to us at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'll do my best to answer each and every one of them. Thank you very much.